Well, listen, if you have a Bible this morning, I want to invite you to turn to the letter of, to the Philippians, Philippians chapter three. Uh, I will meet you there at the end of the sermon, all the verses that we'll read before we get to Philippians three, I'll have on the screen for you. But if you want to read along with me, Philippians chapter three is where we're going to be this morning. If you're new here this morning, let me introduce myself to you. My name is Doug Robinson. I'm the lead minister here at Sugar Grove. I'm really glad that you're here with us. I always say hi to the thousands of people watching on Facebook. Okay, you thought that was funny. That's okay. You didn't buy it at all. That's fine. Anyways, hello to all of you. And uh, I was sad to my mom and dad who watched from Chicago. Uh, soon to be watching from Indiana now. My, my mom and dad, they lived in Houston for like 25 years. And then they moved to Chicago. Which, so they're like living in the two, biggest, two of the biggest cities in America. And uh, my dad's being transferred over to Indiana. He's got a really exciting project there into like a town of like less than 2,000 people. So pray for my mom and dad. My dad grew up in New York City. So he has like, it's just going to be a very foreign world to my dad. So we're cheering for you, dad. Um, well, if you were here last week, then you got to be a part of a great uh, time where Casey Toy wrapped up our first half of our series in Next Steps by going through Romans chapter 14 and 15. She's not here this morning, but let me just tell you, if you didn't get a chance to uh, listen to it, I want to encourage you to do it. Not just because Casey did a phenomenal job, but because what she talked about was so important um, that we need to be a people who are held together and held up by Christ and Christ alone. And uh, I know I want to also thank Blake and Michael for being a part of the video. I know neither of you guys were here. And so it was like all fun and games until the Star Wars versus Harry Potter question came up and then things got really tense. And so if you're like, I think that person just gave me a really nasty look, it was because they disagree. And I just wanted you guys to know they're on the opposite team. So, but thanks for doing the video for us. So what we're going to do over the summer is kind of put next steps on the back burner. Uh, and really kind of go into a different series over the summer, and then we'll pick it back up August 25th when school starts. Now, I've said a couple of times the summer, and I just want to acknowledge that if you are a LCISD teacher or parent of a student, summer has not started yet, and so this is cruel. And I don't apologize, because that's on you and your school district. I just want to at least acknowledge, though, that it's technically not summer for you, even though it's June. That's just... Silly. Uh, so we're going to enter into our summer series in the month of June, July, and three quarters of August. Uh, but like I said, we're not going to say goodbye to next steps, but I would like to put it on the back burner because like one of the very few constant themes in a disciple of Jesus's life is that there will always be change. Like it's actually one of the few constants is that change is going to be like a part of your life. And so you should always be asking, as a follower of Jesus, what are my next steps? And if you're kind of in a place right now where there hasn't been a lot of change, I want to encourage you today, before you go to bed, just talk to God about that and say, hey, God, like part of walking with you is a life of change. And so what are my next steps? What are you calling me to? What are you asking me to step into? And and then certainly as a church in the season that we're in, as a people trying to be unified in Christ and held up by Christ alone, it's important that we ask ourselves, God, What are the next steps that you have for Sugar Grove Church of Christ so that we might be faithful to where you're leading us to? Now, we went through a couple of letters in the first half of the year, and by went through, I mean we kind of did a brief overview of Galatians, 1st and 2nd Thessalonians, 1st and 2nd Corinthians, and Romans. Well done, team. That is a lot. And we skipped a lot of things, and so that just means we can go back and preach them later, and it'll still be new, so I'm really excited about that. But one of the kind of common themes is that Paul was always asking the the churches as a corporate body and the churches as the individuals that make up the church to take next steps in a couple of different categories. Sometimes the next step was between them and God. Sometimes the next step was how they interact with each other within the walls of the church. Sometimes the next step was how they interact with people who aren't yet a part of the family of God. And then sometimes the next steps were involved with just like how they interact with themselves as a new creation in Christ. And then all these kind of things, if they work really well together by the power of the Spirit, it results in kind of this community that's living a transformed life that then attracts other people into what's going on with them. 
Now, this is normally where I'd say, turn to Acts chapter 2, verses 42 through 47, so we can read that, but I said we're going to not put next steps you know, completely out of the picture. So I want to read out of 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, verses 4 through 10, to give you like, just a picture of what all of this looks like as people are finding their identity in Christ and then taking their next steps in these areas. This is what it looks like. Paul's writing to the church, and he says this, For we know, brothers and sisters, loved by God, that he has chosen you, Because our gospel did not come to you in word only, but also in power, in the Holy Spirit, and with full assurance. You know how we lived among you for your benefit, and you yourselves became imitators of us and of the Lord, when, in spite of severe persecution, you welcomed the message with joy from the Holy Spirit." As a result, you became an example to all the believers in Macedonia and Achaia. For the word of the Lord rang out from you, not only in Macedonia and Achaia, but in every place that your faith in God has gone out. Therefore, we don't need to say anything, for they themselves report what kind of reception we had from you. How you turned to God from idols to serve the living and true God, and to wait for his Son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, Jesus, who rescues us, from the coming wrath. Now, in a lot of neat ways, that's like just a beautiful picture of what it means for people to be transformed by King Jesus and then live a life that's for him and for their neighbor. Paul says, we moved in, lived with you in mind so that you might come to know Christ. You came to know Christ and then you started to imitate us. And now this reputation of these Jesus people that just live these radical and questionable lives just continues to rep, like just go out from there. But think about the very practical, social, implications of this. These are people who heard about some people talking about a guy named Jesus who they're making some pretty big claims about and they like trusted and believed and then they had this thing happen to them and then they like went to work the next day. They walked the streets the next day. They walked by the marketplace. They passed the idols that were there the day before and were there the day after but now they have like a new perspective now they've got to have a new lens on everything. Their life has been turned upside down in light of what they now believe about Jesus. And so they kind of have this like disconnect with the world that they're walking in because they have a different perspective from the rest of them. I was thinking about this as we were preparing for the summer, and it reminded me of a bit from a comedian that I really like named Nate Bargatze. Any Nate Bargatze fans in the house? That's right. Team Nate Bargatze. The three of us will get together. We'll watch his Netflix special after church. Well, I hope you'll like him after this because I kind of need you to think this is funny or the sermon's going to go nowhere from here. Uh, I've brought a clip where he talks about this kind of being in a world but knowing some things and seeing some things different from the rest of the people in the world. Watch this clip. I think of it like, uh, like time, time traveling. traveling. Like if, if I could go, go back in time, time. Like if, if I could go back in time, time tonight, tonight and go, and go back, back to like, to like the, the 20s, 20s knowing, knowing everything, everything I know, I know Right, right now, now, I don't think I, don't I, would, think make I would make a difference. A difference. <laughs> I don't think, I don't you, think guys you guys would even hear about it. About it. I, don't I don't think you would. I just, I just don't. Because like, I, don't I don't have anything to get, you know. Like, like I would go back, and I would, and I would see, see like, some guy on an old, old phone, phone, and I'd be like, hey, eventually they have phones you like carry in your pocket. And they're like, yes, like, how do they do it? I'm like, I mean, I don't know how they do it. I think, I think it's a satellite. A satellite. I, think I think the satellite. satellite they're like, what's a satellite? Oh, I should have even said, said that. that. Uh, it's like, it's like metal. metal. Metal's, Metal's going to go, go pretty high in the air. In the air. I, don't know I don't know if you guys are doing it. I don't, I don't even know if I, I can prove I'm from the future. future. I don't, I don't even think I could. could. I, think I think I would just get stuck. Because they would want something. Like, who's the next president? Oh, boy. Abraham Lincoln. You guys are going to love him. He's really good. They just, they just think I'm from, from the past. past. That's, That's what they were like. They would just, just look at They don't have to get a regular job. job. I, would I would just have to like wait tables or something. In the, in the 20s. 20s. I, would I would go back in time and do worse than, than I'm doing right now. I think of it like, uh, like time traveling. You'll like him. Uh, he's got a couple specials on Netflix. You can check it out. So, so Nate like walks into the world and kind of has this different perspective and this fake scenario and this different kind of language. He's got this kind of futuristic language, if you will. 
And I don't think it's very unsimilar from the Thessalonians walking into the marketplace. Now, they might not have a language of the future. They're kind of speaking the language of this, like, new religion that they found in Jesus. And so I'm going to call it Christianese. That the Thessalonians are kind of walking through their marketplace and they're speaking the language of Christianese. Now, it's funny when it's Nate Bargatze and it's a fake conversation about a thing that could never happen, like going back in the past, being confronted with the language that you're using and not having an answer. But it becomes much more Uh, awkward when it becomes a reality. Like, for example, let's say this morning you came to like church metal, and we sang the great hymn, Come Thou Fount. Now, we did it this morning because I didn't want you to feel you bad if you don't know what I'm about to go through. But let's say we were singing Come Thou Fount and we get to verse 2 and this lyric pops on the screen. Here I raise my Ebenezer. Hither by thy help I come. And as you're singing that in this room, your neighbor, like literally the person next to you is like, boom. Hey, I noticed you were singing that. What is an Ebenezer? It's it's a good thing. It's, uh, and then you're like stuck, right? You're trapped. If you don't know, then you're like, then you just start rambling off of, you're like, it's, it's, uh, it's a reminder of God's grace and mercy, and they're like, oh yeah, I've heard a lot about that. Could you tell me the difference between grace and mercy? Who shouldn't have brought that up. They're both good things from God, and it just becomes really, really vague. Now, for Nate, it makes sense because he never claimed to be a scientist when he was from the future. He just claimed to be from the future. But if it was us or the Thessalonians, it would become really awkward because here we are saying our lives have been transformed by this King Jesus. We now have a new perspective. We now have a new language. And then someone says, well, hey, what does Ebenezer mean? I don't know about you, but I kind of want to have the answer. And then I also don't know about you, but a lot of times I simply don't. I'm just kind of speaking Christianese. Now, if you're wondering, here's what Ebenezer means. It's actually two Hebrew words put together. It means stone of help. It's also a, commemorating, a commemoration of divine help. And if you looked it up, it would tell you to go to 1 Samuel chapter 7, which we will because it's really good. Here's the story of Israelites who are in some trouble. And Samuel took a young lamb and offered it as a whole burnt offering to the Lord. He cried out to the Lord on behalf of Israel, and the Lord answered him. Samuel was offering the burnt offering as the Philistines approached to fight against Israel. And the Lord thundered loudly against the Philistines that day and threw them into such confusion that they were defeated by Israel. Then the men of Israel charged out of Mizpah and pursued the Philistines, striking them down all the way to a place below Bethkar. Afterwards, Samuel took a stone, set it upright between Mizpah and Shen. He named it Ebenezer, explaining the Lord has helped us to this point. And now when you know like where the writer of Come Thou Fount is coming from, and you read the lyric, here I raise this reminder that God, you've helped me get to where I am. In fact, it's only by your help that I've come. I don't know about you, but I just feel, A, significantly more comfortable in singing what I'm singing. But all of a sudden, it reveals to me that there is like a depth to this song that I've missed out on because I've grown comfortable singing words that I just don't know. And so what I'd like for us to do over the summer is spend some time talking about speaking Christianese. I'd like for us to look at some words that I think a lot of times we sing or that we'll talk about or that we'll pray that will come when we are participating in our next steps, that people will look at us and go, how do they do it? And you can go beyond a satellite. Do you guys know what that even means? And so here's what I'm going to ask at the start of this. You may be thinking of some words that you often hear in a prayer or that we sing or that we read out of the letters that Paul writes to the church, that when we get to it, you're like, I have no idea what I just read or sang. I wanna encourage you to email me or text me that word. Now you may be embarrassed to admit that word, so lie and say your friend asked you to email me or text me that word. It's fine, I will not sell you out. But I'm, I'm curious, what are words that are in the Christianese vernacular that we often use that you kind of go, man, either I don't know what an Ebenezer is or I don't know the depth of it and I'd like to explore it. Now we kind of got an idea on where we're going so I don't make any guarantees that I'll get to your word. But I'm super curious about the words that you might want to talk about when we kind of open up a space to just say, hey, there are some words that we use a lot and I think it'd be really good to understand the depth of it. 
Now, when we think about the author of our letters, the Apostle Paul, he is uh, significantly ahead of the rest of us. He's got a great advantage over all of us given his background. He tells his testimony a couple of times in uh, some letters that one of which we've read this year already and one of which we haven't. The first time he tells his story is in Galatians. Here's Paul kind of sharing his testimony with the church that he's writing to. He says, listen, you've heard about my former way of life in Judaism. I intensely persecuted God's church and tried to destroy it. I advanced in Judaism beyond many contemporaries among my people because I was extremely zealous for the traditions of my ancestors. Side note, zeal. Anybody right now going, I don't, mm, zeal. That's a Christianese word. If you were, here's what zeal means. It's a single-minded desire characterized by enthusiasm and devotion. And for Paul, it really was this demand from his scripture to act as God's agent and rid Israel of any and all corruption. So Paul's extremely zealous because of his devotion to God. And he's grown up a Jew amongst Jews. And so within Paul is an understanding of the scripture that trumps us all 10 times over. It's just innate in him. I, there's this commentator that I really like. His name is Richard Hayes. You should read everything that he wrote. And he talks about how like within Paul is just like in his bones is the language that we kind of have to riff off of and look up. So Paul kind of has this starting point because of his background that when he meets Jesus, Jesus just has him reorient all that he thought without abandoning what he grew up in. No longer is he zealous because of the Torah. He's zealous because of what Christ has done in him. And no longer is it to rid people, but it's to proclaim the hope found in Christ. And so as he's telling his story in Galatians, it comes naturally to him to use the language of scripture to talk about what God's doing in his life. Here's how we continue. But when God, who from my mother's womb set me apart and called me by his grace, was pleased to reveal his son in me so that I could not preach him, or so that I could preach him among the Gentiles, I did not immediately consult with anyone. Now, I've kind of highlighted and put in italics those phrases, because if you know the prophets, like Paul, which is, it's just in his bones, it's just how he speaks, it's, he, man, he's, he's fluent in Christianese, then you know that he's borrowing language from the prophets. Here's the prophet Isaiah And now says the Lord, who formed me from the womb to be his servant, to bring Jacob back to him so that Israel might be gathered to him. For I am honored in the sight of the Lord, and my God is my strength. He says, it is not enough for you to be my servant, raising up the tribes of Jacob and restoring the protected ones of Israel. I will also make you a light for the nations to be my salvation to the ends of the earth. Or the prophet Jeremiah, where he's borrowing language from. This is Jeremiah 1, 4 through 7. The word of the Lord came to me. I chose you before I formed you in the womb. I set you apart before you were born, and I appointed you a prophet to the nations. But I protested, oh no, Lord God, look, I don't know how to speak since I am only a youth. And then the Lord said to me, do not say I am only a youth, for you will go to everyone I send you to and speak whatever I tell you. So when Paul's thinking about what Jesus has done in his life and specifically thinking about the call that Jesus has put on his life, he doesn't just kind of pick random words and phrases. No, out of his scripture that he knows so well, he borrows language to tell you what's going on in his life. Read again Galatians chapter 1. When God, who from my mother's womb set me apart and called me by his grace, was pleased to reveal his son in me, so that I could preach him among the Gentiles. I did not immediately consult with anyone. I did not go up to Jerusalem to those who had become apostles before me. Instead, I went to Arabia and came back to Damascus. Then after three years, I did go up to Jerusalem to get to know Cephas, and I stayed with him 15 days. And he continues to just lay out his story. Now, in the letter to the Galatians, he's really reflecting on his specific call to be an apostle and to defend it. He tells his story again in the letter to the Philippians. So if you turn to Philippians chapter 3, about 19 minutes and 10 seconds ago, you can now reopen it because that's where we are. But what I want you to notice is that is gone from the Philippians that was in Galatians is the mention and the details of the specific call that Jesus has given to Paul. Right When Jesus meets Paul, he is now set apart with a specific call. He's going to borrow the language of the prophets because that's how he views himself now. 
that God is calling Paul to be a prophet to go to the nations to proclaim what he's done in Jesus. When he tells his story to the Philippians, gone is the call and instead is more of a general thing and then introduced into this passage, I want you to notice, is the language of imitation, what we saw in 1 Thessalonians. Because apparently there are some things that's happened to Paul that are very specific to him. And then there are some things that have happened to Paul that should also happen to the Thessalonians, to the Philippians, and to, hey, the Sugar Grovians. Jared and I didn't even plan that. Boom. That's awesome. All right, Philippians chapter 3, starting in verse 4. Notice how he's going to tell you how his life was like before Christ. If anyone else thinks he has grounds for confidence in the flesh, I have more, Paul says, circumcised the eighth day of the nation of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew born of Hebrews, regarding the law of Pharisee, regarding zeal, remember we just went over zeal, persecuting the church, regarding the righteousness that is in the law, blameless. But everything that was a gain to me, I've considered to be a loss because of Christ." More than that, I also consider everything to be a loss in view of the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. Because of him, I have suffered the loss of all things and consider them as dung, so that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own from the law, but one that is through faith in Christ, the righteousness from God based on faith. Now, there are going to be a couple times during this series that I'm just going to guess when we're speaking Christianese a little bit. I guessed on zeal. Maybe you knew that, and if you did, well done. I'm going to guess again and say righteousness is one of those terms that we often sing about and pray and read in the scripture, but I don't know exactly what righteousness means, so here's the definition. It means to be in right relationship with God. It means to be forgiven and given a place in God's family, and it results in transformation by grace. And Paul says, when I met Christ, I had the resume of resumes. I was passing the test. I had everything that you could want and more, and I consider it rubbish, dung, nothing in light of what I found in Christ, that I am now in a right relationship with God, that I am now forgiven and in God's family, and I am now experiencing transformation by grace. What does he say? Not from the law but as one that is through faith in Christ, the righteousness from God based on faith. So this has resulted in a radical transformation for Paul. He continues, my goal is now to know him. It was to know the law. It was to know the Torah. Now it's to know him and then through him, the Torah and law. And the power of his resurrection, and I want to know the fellowship of his suffering being conformed to his death assuming that I will somehow reach the resurrection from among the dead. Not that I've already reached the goal or am already perfect, but I make every effort to take hold of it because I, have also, because I also have been taken hold of by Christ Jesus. Brothers and sisters, I do not consider myself to have taken hold of it, but one thing I do, forgetting what is behind and reaching forward to what is ahead, I pursue as my goal the prize promised by God's heavenly call in Christ Jesus. Therefore, let all of us who are mature think this way. And if you think differently about anything, God will reveal this also to you. In any case, we should live up to whatever truth we have attained. And then here he introduces the idea of imitation. Pay close attention to this. This is important for us moving into this summer and what we've been talking about when it comes to next steps. He says, join in imitating me, brothers and sisters, and pay careful attention to those who live according to the example you have in us. So remember, when he was talking about his call that he got from Christ, this language wasn't present. But when it comes to understanding and knowing Christ and forgetting what's behind and pressing on towards what ahead, this transformation, being a part of God's family, receiving and experiencing transformation by grace, hey, join in with me. And pay attention to also those who live according to the example you have in us. For I have often told you and now say again with tears that many live as enemies of the cross of Christ. And their end is destruction. And their God is their stomach. And their glory is in their shame, 
They're focused on earthly things. But our citizenship, our citizenship is in heaven. And we eagerly wait for a savior from there, the Lord Jesus Christ. See, he will transform the body of our humble condition into the likeness of his glorious body by the power that enables him to subject everything to himself. Paul says, imitate me and pay attention to those who are living as though they imitate us. And then he starts talking about citizenship and comparing people who live for themselves versus people who live because of what Christ has done in them. And I think this is such an important passage for us, particularly at the the start of this series. Because if you're like me, what can become, uh, this series could become very, very academic. It could just be like, yeah, you know what? I, I, I couldn't pass the grammar test. I couldn't pass the word study test if you gave me a test on some of these really complex words. And so I'm really excited to learn them so that I can academically understand what I'm reading better and pass the test in which I've been called to take. And if you notice, Paul's lifestyle of passing the test, he counts as nothingness. To know Christ, to make him known, to walk as citizens of God, it's not an academic pursuit. It's an act of worship. And so my hope is, is that as we step into this series, that we would be a people who are transformed by Jesus, and as a result of experiencing what it means to be in the family of God, we would long to know him better, and long to be able to speak of him, and be able to put words to what we know to be true. That we would long not only that for ourselves, but for the people that we come in contact with, so that when they say, why are you living for me and not for yourself? Why are you living as if you're a citizen of another world? We might have a language in which to highlight and proclaim and make much of the loving kindness that Jesus has shown each and every one of us. It's, it's not an academic pursuit. It's an act of worship because it is a declaration of a reality that exists today. Nate Bargatze could not tell the people in the past how the cell phone works, but he knew it because he was that. He was a person from the future. And Paul says, act as what you are. Behave as what you are. Speak as what you are. You are, because of Christ, now a citizen of the kingdom of God. And so you will walk as a person from the future You will see things differently. You will say things differently. You will have a different language that people will ask questions and that you might be able to highlight Christ and make much of him. This is what it means to be for God and for neighbor. This is what it means to be transformed. This is what it means to behave as a citizen of God. And so we'll go from this place and we'll proclaim the gospel. And the gospel, that's a really good word. Let's talk about that one next week. But for now, for now, may we sugar grove. Like, just let go of any kind of like, yeah, I got to do, I got to pass the test. And so let's get this academically down and let's get flashcards and memorize it. But instead step into, no, like, like I've experienced what life is like outside of the family of God. And now I know what life inside the family is God, God is like because of what Christ has done. And so I, I want to swim into the depths of what it means to know him and to speak of him and to make much of him. This is our call for the summer, and I hope you'll step into it with me.